The next speaker is Michael Dosa, an Austrian working for CERN, and he's going to talk about one of the exciting research fields, and that is antimatter. I don't want to waste any time, so I am not going to give a lengthy introduction. Rather, I'd hand over to Michael Dosa immediately. Uh, so, as an Austrian, I should actually be speaking German, um, but in this case, because of the international audience, again, Gerfried has asked me to say what I have to say in English, and he's also asked me to do something else, uh, to talk a little bit about a philosophical topic rather than plunge directly into the antimatter itself. So I'll be talking about all the antimatters, of course, and uh, as you can see from the warning sign, antimatter is a very dangerous substance, but I'll try to convince you that actually it's not antimatter that's the dangerous substance, but rather matter. But before I get there, I'd like to say a few words about um, what you heard this morning. You've heard about the great discovery potential of the LHC. You've heard about Higgs boson. You've heard about supersymmetry, extra dimensions, dark matter, dark energy. So these are part of the things that the LHC is supposed to find. What you haven't heard about is that there's a whole slew of further ideas, not just the ones I just mentioned, but um, Higgs doublets, compositeness, excited fermions, gluino balls, leptoquarks, technicolor, and so on and so on. You can see particle physicists are very good at inventing rather colorful names. And all of this is actually because up to now, we don't have a very good model of what goes beyond the standard model. In fact, all these things I just mentioned are almost certainly wrong, but theorists have been preparing them very seriously and have been working for a very, very long time to try to explore alternatives to the standard model. The Higgs and supersymmetry are one possibility, but there are many, many others. Now, this profusion of models, of possibilities, isn't because people have nothing better to do. And it, it's also not because the standard model doesn't work. We know very well that the standard model has taken pretty much everything we can throw at it and has digested it without a scratch. The real reason why all these models are on the market and have sticking their neck out is because we know that the standard model is incomplete. There are certain things in the standard model that are unexplained, and they were presented this morning by Sergio, by um, Rolf, and also by Paul. We know that there are extraneous parameters, the number of families the masses of the individual particles, and a whole slew of further parameters that one has to put into the standard model ad hoc. So there has to be something that goes beyond the standard model that explains these parameters. At least that's what we believe to a certain degree. What also is certain is that within the standard model, there are links between the observables that we have. And so to a certain degree, one can also see beyond the energy limit of any collider even of the LHC, into areas that sort of presage their existence by the shadows. You can get influences of particles that you have not observed yet through their influence on particles that you do observe. And so this is one of the reasons why the Higgs boson has been predicted to lie in a very well-defined window that is being searched now by the LHC. So these links can be exploited. Unfortunately, there are many ways to account for these links. There's not just one way, but many, many different ways. And the only thing you can do in such a situation, at least speaking as an experimentalist, is when you're faced with a profusion of models that go from supersymmetry, Higgsless models, Z primes, classical ons, extra dimensions, and so on, is to bring out your garden shares and cut out the branches, those branches that are superfluous and that have nothing to do with reality. The wrong models have to be eliminated. And there's only one way you can do this, and that's by doing the experiments. So the experiments are the only thing that will give you guidance as to how to go beyond the standard model. We've been doing this for a year now. The LHC has been running. It's been running extremely well. I hope uh, Sergio convinced you of that. And we have enormous amounts of data. And so, of course, natural question is, are we there yet? You get in the car and you're driving off to, from Vienna, say, to um, Paris, and come Linz, the kids get nervous and say, are we there yet? Well, we're not quite there yet. It's just the beginning of the trip. And it's far too early to speculate about the possibility that nothing new will be found. In fact, up to now, the only thing that one has been able to do is to cover the, the ground that is already known and go a little bit into the unexplored territory and to start looking for low-lying fruit. 
But the really difficult fruit, those that are interesting, they'll take a long time to pick. And again, the, mo the reason why the standard model is not complete, why we know it's not complete, is not experimental up to now. There's no evidence on the experimental point of view. It's theoretical. And theorists have also shown, using the linkages of the measurements of the particles that we know, that something new must happen in the energy range of the LHC. But of course, this never stops speculation. People will think about what might happen. And so what if the theorists are wrong? What if these theories that we are looking at right now are not correct? And there really is nothing to see within the energy range of the LHC. And the interesting bits are beyond the LHC. So I have a quote there by Frank Wilczek to say it's too early to worry, of course, but it's never too early to think about it. So what do you do, assuming you don't find anything really interesting? Well, you can give up and go home. Uh, that's not what a, an experimentalist does. That's not what a physicist does. That not, that's not what we human beings do. As humans, we want to find out how these things work. And besides, it's a lot of fun to try and find out and to see if you can find out something new. So let's scratch that one. Another possibility is to sit down and start thinking. You scratch your head and you try to think of other ways in which the ideas of these different models can be tested. Even if you can't see them right now, maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe our assumptions are wrong. Maybe we can look within existing experiments in a different way, look at different signatures, try to filter out the collisions in a different manner. So this is one way to use the LHC even if on a first attempt you don't find anything. You can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into it. But you can also use the fact that everything is linked. And this is a very important aspect of physics. All the different levels, all the physics happening at the LHC, all the way down to the coldest atoms that you can think of, atomic physics, cryogenic detectors, astrophysics, all these things are linked with each other. And if you do not see something in one area, you might find it in another area, or you might find an indirect influence in another area. So you should always try to look at a signal or a result in a specific, specific area, but you should also think about how it affects other areas and how those other areas constrain it. So there are experiments at very low energies studying the decays of atoms that can test to a certain degree and very indirectly what the LHC can see. So this is the first plan. You do what you already have infrastructure for, you use the current experiments to their fullest. Another possibility is, of course, that you sit down, scratch your head, and think of other ways in which the models that you have can be tested in a different way in new experiments that can still use the same kind of infrastructure. So you think of a different way in which the LHC, other infrastructure accelerators, can be used to come up with a new way of doing an experiment in case you perhaps missed something and can find a new way to do this. And this can be at a high energy physics particle collider. It can also be at low energies. Alternatively, you can send the theorists back home and tell them to come up with new testable ideas, which is really what is their job. If their theories do not reproduce what is observed, then the theories are wrong. And so the theories have to be updated. And they have to be updated in a testable manner. You heard this morning about, um, well, multiverses. And one of the things that has always struck me about multiverses is it's a brilliant explanation, but it's not really obvious to see how you can test that idea. And without being tested, an idea is just that. It's sort of an ad hoc explanation. So one always has to think about, when writing a theory, how you can actually test this theory. And it's only then, when it's been confronted with experiment, that it becomes a solid theory, believable. And of course, no matter what you do, the problems won't go away. We know that these, the standard model is incomplete. We know what the questions are about the standard model. And we have to solve these somehow. Now, for the next few years, we'll be trying to test the standard model. We'll be attacking the standard model, throwing pretty much everything we can at it. And it's going to be an interesting ride, so relax and enjoy the scenery during that time. But perhaps I can take an example from another field where this interplay between different areas, different areas of physics, is very necessary. And in fact, it turns out that this is going to be rooting for the underdogs because compared to the big LHC experiments, these experiments are a little bit smaller. These experiments happen in three different areas. They happen in high energy physics, they happen in astrophysics, and they happen at low energy in atomic physics. And all three of them look at the same question, a very embarrassing question that you can ask pretty much every physicist uh, to embarrass them, and that is to explain why the universe is not empty. It's an observable fact, and it's in total contradiction with the standard model. So this is one area where the standard model completely fails. 
you heard it before, I, I'm talking about antimatter. Matter and antimatter particles are always produced in pairs. Every time you transform energy into stuff, you get a particle and an antiparticle at the same time. These are pictures of exactly that kind of process where you see an electron and an anti-electron being produced in pairs. And this exactly is the same kind of process must have happened right after the Big Bang or right at the moment immediately after the Big Bang. And so right after the Big Bang, the universe must have consisted to 50% of matter and to 50% of antimatter. There's just no way around that. But if you look at the universe now, what you see is if you can filter, you put a filter on the Hubble telescope which says only look at matter, only show me matter, you see the picture on the left with these hundreds of billions of galaxies, each containing hundreds of billions of stars. If you put a filter on the Hubble telescope to tell you what you could see if the stuff were antimatter, what you would see is on the right hand side. There's no antimatter in the universe. All the antimatter that was there at the Big Bang is gone. And I'm going to try to convince you that this was a murder. What happened to the antimatter? Well, you know Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, They're very famous characters. One of them is the good guy, one of them is the bad guy. Well, it's not who you think it is. Dr. Jekyll is actually the bad guy. Dr. Jekyll is the one who murdered all the antimatter. And the one bit that's left over is just the murderer. So if you start out with a symmetric universe where at the moment of the Big Bang you have energy transforming into matter, you should get equal amounts of matter and antimatter. The matter and the antimatter in equal amounts will annihilate each other. They will kill each other off. And what's left over at the end is just a little bit of excess of matter. And so rather than having a symmetric universe, now we have an asymmetric universe, a completely matter-dominated universe where all the antimatter has disappeared. Like at any other crime scene, when you have a murder, you have two options. So this is a picture of the evolution of the universe since the Big Bang, very condensed cartoon form. And there are two areas where you can think about trying to find out further information about what happened in this murder. One is at late times. You can investigate the crime scene, you can look out with telescopes and see what is actually still out there. If this gives you any information on what happened at very, very early times. And the other possibility is to reenact the crime scene uh, by colliding particles with each other and seeing whether you can find out something interesting about matter and antimatter that will give you a hint as to why matter was more powerful in eliminating antimatter than the other way around. So crime scene investigation. Let's start with looking out into the universe. And if you're looking for antimatter, the easiest thing you can do when looking for antimatter is to look at the annihilation of matter with antimatter. And so if you look at it through a telescope, you can look for the annihilation of electrons with anti-electrons. That produces light in a very specific color. And this is what the universe looks like in that light. In fact, this is, if you could just see that one thing, this would tell you that there is antimatter out in the universe. But it would also tell you that all the antimatter we can see, the anti-electrons, are at the center of our galaxy. The coordinate system is centered on the center of our galaxy where there is a huge black hole and most likely, the anti-electrons that we see annihilating with electrons here are produced in the vicinity of this black hole or in stars in that general area. Now anti-electrons are very easy to create. In fact, even in thunderstorms you can produce anti-electrons. Uh, very recently, a detector flying on a satellite saw anti-electrons being produced from a thunderstorm in Africa. So all you need is a little bit of energy, a few hundred thousand volts, and voila, you have anti-electrons. So this is not very good to really see where the antimatter that was produced right after the Big Bang went. We have to go a little bit deeper than that. We actually have to look for heavier particles like antiprotons or even heavier than that. And for that you best have a detector that is sitting up above the Earth. Because antimatter, if there is antimatter out in the universe that would crash into the atmosphere, it would annihilate and we would not see it at that point. Whereas if you have a detector that's flying up above the surface of the atmosphere, higher than the atmosphere, you'll see the cosmic rays, the stuff coming from the stars and from the, from the galaxies, purely, just the way it comes flying through space. And so this alpha magnetic spectrometer has just started operation trying to detect 
the composition of cosmic rays, trying to see if there are any cosmic rays still made of, up of antimatter, trying to see if there's any antimatter left from the Big Bang that would lead to formation of anti-stars, anti-galaxies, anti-life perhaps even. So we'll know in a few years whether astrophysical observations allow the possibility of antimatter in space. But since this is not the first experiment, chances are not really that great. So the alternative to that is to reenact the crime scene, do it in a lab, try to produce antimatter in a lab, study it very precisely, and see if you can find a difference between the two. Because remember, the two should be absolutely identical. And at CERN, there are two places where antimatter is being studied, pointed to by the arrows. Um, well, actually, three places. If anybody has seen Angels and Demons, this is also a study of antimatter at CERN, as you can see, but not a very scientific one. So if you try to study antimatter in the lab, you have basically four suspects. There are four criminal suspects that should be lined up and investigated very carefully. One of them is neutrino physics, which is not something that's being done at CERN. One of them is a slight difference in the decay properties of particles and their antiparticles. And this is technically called CP violation. It's a violation of asymmetry. It's a difference of seeing something happening here and seeing something happening in a mirror. So it's a breaking of asymmetry. And this kind of CP violation has already been seen in the past, but not in very large amounts. And by investigating it in further systems, one can try to understand better whether this is the mechanism, or whether one needs additional mechanisms. Or one can go even more fundamental. One can really go down to the properties themselves of particles and antiparticles. This is called CPT violation, CPT symmetry, which really says that particles and antiparticles have the same charge, the same mass, the same lifetime, the same magnetic moment. So if you try to measure a particle and its antiparticle and compare them very precisely, you're actually testing that more fundamental symmetry. And much of 20th century physics, quantum field theories, are built on the fact that CPT is not violated. So this is a rather hopeless endeavor, but nevertheless, it's worthwhile trying if you can. And then the last possibility is to look at gravity. What is the gravitational interaction of antimatter and matter? The only thing we can say is that an apple on Earth and an anti-apple on an anti-Earth will fall exactly the same way. But what an anti-apple on Earth will do, we have no idea. So, one can try to do the experiment. And the nice thing about these experiments is that they are mostly at low energy, low energy being somewhat lower than the LHC, although one can do some of these at the LHC as well. So to test CPT, to study antimatter, to measure very pre precisely the properties of antimatter, the best thing one can do is to form atoms of antimatter and compare the properties of these atoms with the properties of the corresponding matter equivalent. So what you're trying to do is measure the light emitted by an anti-atom and the light emitted by an atom. And to do that, you have to make these atoms, but more importantly, you have to trap them. Now here, um, well, we don't have a Brooklyn superhero supply company, so unfortunately we cannot use them to furnish us with anti-hydrogen atoms. Nor do we have a trap as in Angels and Demons, where this is supposed to represent anti-hydrogen atoms in a trap. What we can do instead is build a real trap, an apparatus that will be in a position to form antihydrogen atoms, to trap them, and allow us to study the light that they emit. And if you look very carefully at this apparatus, it's actually just a magnet, a complicated magnet, at the center of which there's something glowing, and that's supposed to represent antihydrogen atoms, because they would emit the same color of light as hydrogen, which is ultraviolet. So you should see ultraviolet light. Now this is just a technical sketch, or actually an artist's a rendition of what it should look like. This is what the reality looks like. And if you remember the experiments that you saw this morning, the LHC pictures, these beautiful large apparatuses, well, this is the other end of the world. Um, it's cheap, it's small, and it's a mess. But it allows you to make antihydrogen to trap it since last year, and now to start thinking about studying it. So this is one thing you can do, try to measure the color of light of antihydrogen. Another thing you can try to do is to measure the gravitational interaction. Try to let antihydrogen fall. So all you need to do is you climb the Tower of Pisa, you take hydrogen and antihydrogen, one in each hand, and you drop them. And you see what happens. This has never been done before. 
This is the first time such an experiment actually has become feasible now that we know how to make antihydrogen atoms. And my hope is, of course, that as in the past, surprises tend to show up in those areas where you haven't looked before. There's no point in looking for your keys under a lamppost if you've been walking around the dark before. Now, this is actually a very good example of the kind of collaboration that we hope we'll see in the future between CERN and Ars Electronica, because it has led to a very lucrative bet, which you may have already seen, um, between myself and one of the Ars Electronica uh, organizers, Horst Hörtner. If antimatter falls like normal matter, I win. Horst pays me, a, well, a crate of champagne, actually. It's a good bet. Um, if antimatter falls differently from matter, I have to pay the champagne to Horst. But okay, that's something I would love to lose. And the third thing you can try is not trap antihydrogen, but really try to measure the color in a different way. If you, rather than try to trap antihydrogen, you produce a stream of antihydrogen atoms, then you can also measure the color of the light. In that area encircled in red, you can see something called a microwave cavity. Microwaves are just another form of light. And so by looking at how antihydrogen reacts to microwaves and how hydrogen reacts to microwaves, one can compare the two again very precisely and look for a difference. And this is an extraordinarily sensitive test. In fact, it's so sensitive that you should be able, if you could compare it to something reasonable, to reach a precision of the weight of a pin compared to the weight of the Großglöckner. Think of the Großglöckner, 3,000, 4,000 meters high. You cut it, off of, cut it off at the base, you put it on a balance, you weigh it, you put a pin on top, you weigh it again, and you can tell the difference between the two. That's the kind of precision this experiment will be able to reach. And in fact, this is one of the experiments led by an Austrian group. Uh, the Asakusa experiment has a participation of an institute of, um, uh, from Vienna, the Stefan Mayer Institute. Now the other alternative, if you don't think that CPT symmetry is um, the criminal, you can try to look for CP violation by producing very specific types of particles and antiparticles. And in fact, the interesting thing about this system or these kinds of systems is that it allows a particle made up of a quark and an antiquark to transform itself into another antiparticle this time where the quark transforms into the antiquark and the antiquark into the quark. So you've not actually changed very much, you've transformed one into the other, but now instead of having a particle, you end up with an antiparticle, and this antiparticle can behave differently, it can decay differently than the particle itself. So if you look at the drawing at the bottom, this is a so-called Feynman graph, which in a pictorial fashion describes what happens at the level of the quarks, where on the left-hand side, a anti-quark, an anti-B quark, transforms itself into three quarks, one anti-quark and two quarks. And on the other side, you see this funny box in the center. And it's this kind of box, in this case, it's the T quark that appears there for a very short instant. It's a virtual particle. Just like that can happen, like the T quark, which is something we already know, can appear for a short moment. Other heavier, unknown particles can also appear. And this will affect the mix of those two final states of the particle and of the antiparticle. And if you can study very precisely how the particle decays, how the antiparticle decays, and how they interfere with each other, then you learn something about possibly additional heavy particles that we have not yet seen. Now to do this, you have to produce lots of these particles, these B mesons, and to produce B mesons made up of a B quark, you require a B factory. One of them is in Japan, uh, it's the so-called Bell experiment, and there again, the Austrian Institute of Particle Physics, HEFI, is involved. Or you can do it at the LHC, because the LHC produces a lot of particles, a lot of antiparticles, and a lot of B mesons. The LHCb experiment is specialized in looking at that. So what you're trying to do there, what you're trying to measure very precisely, is how often this switch from particle to antiparticle and back happens. And this opens a window to physics beyond the standard model. Again, a different way of looking at beyond the standard model physics, but another one that is very sensitive. This is what that experiment looks like. You can see, contrary to the other experiments that you saw this morning, this one here is not a big cylinder. It's not a symmetric structure. Everything happens at the bottom right-hand side, and all the rest is just there to follow the decay products as they evolve and to identify them. And to do that, one needs a very powerful magnet, and one needs to have the protons from the LHC, 
and one needs to channel the protons that are flying through the LHC through the apparatus. So actually, you can see this beam pipe, this pipe in the center. This is where the protons of the LHC fly through in full blast from both sides, the ones that didn't collide, which is almost all of them. Whereas the debris of the collision will fly through this apparatus to the left and then through the apparatus, through the different layers of the detector, which allow one then to reconstruct the decay properties of the particles and of the antiparticles. So I've shown you that antimatter is being looked at in three different domains. At, in the astrophysical domain, where one may hope to find some remnants of the Big Bang uh, antimatter. In atomic physics, where one hopes to find a slight difference in the properties of atoms and antiatoms. And in high energy physics. And these three are linked with each other. If you find something in one, it has an influence on the other. And if you don't find something in the third, that also has a repercussion on the other two. So this is all a very nice knit system of particle physics, but I also wanted to mention two other areas where antimatter plays an important role. The first one you've already heard about. The medical applications of antimatter are quite uh, well known. PET scans are known. Radiation therapy is another possibility. But I also wanted to point out, because this is after all an art festival also, in addition to being technology in society, that there is also a role for antimatter in art. And um, you'll see in a second, this might even be a future funding opportunity for both fields. The first example I want to give you is a picture by Salvador Dali, a painting that was made in 1956. 1956 is the year where the antiproton was discovered. And immediately, Dali picked up on it, painted a picture called Antiprotonic Assumption, which represents the Virgin ascending through the power of her own antiprotons. So he's invented in a way the antimatter drive, which was then taken on board by Star Trek uh, in a little bit more efficient manner. But this is actually not a very good way to make money. Of course, if you had bought the picture, say, 50 years ago, um, you could now sell it for a significant sum of money. But the real way to make money, we all know, is not in art, nor in physics, it's in banking. And so what you really need to do is what Jonathan Keats did, to open up the first bank of antimatter, and rather than deposit gold, he deposits antimatter, which is probably the most valuable substance on Earth. And with that, I've given you an overview of antimatter and the interests it has for us and explained why anti matters. Thank you. <laughs>